GM. Hi everyone, and welcome to a game analysis. I haven't done one of these for a while, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I'm going to be looking at one of my own games, which I only played two days ago, uh, three days ago, and this is in the Four Nations chess event in England. The Four Nations, because you have most of the nations of the British Isles, Wales, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland, uh, competing. Uh, and some of the best players sort of in Britain teaming up against other players from uh, around the country as well. I play for Team Cheddleton, <laughs> led by Fiona. Here's um, a picture of some of us in the team. Um, all looking very happy there. And you can see this is our team list from the match I'm going to be talking about. And I'm, I've got a very tough game against Grandmaster Lupulescu of Romania 2640. So uh, I'm going to talk about this game. Hopefully you'll learn something from my thinking, especially if you're a, a Black Lion player. Uh, my course on the Black Lion is coming out now in only six days on Chessable. So keep an eye open for that, for a full course on how to play against 1e4 in an exciting way. So my opponent played e4 here. And I thought, well, I'm going to play the black line. You know, I've just been working on this course for a fantastic amount of time. I know it very well now, which you also will when you buy the course uh, on chessboard. And I thought, what better way to try this out rather than playing a very strong player? You know, this is like top 100 player in the world, uh, young grandmaster. Uh, and let's give it a go. Let's see what he's got against the black line because I have faith in it. And generally, I, I always play openings I've recorded something on. You know, I'm a man who, you know, I, I want to I want to play the openings I work on. I have faith in them and I want to share that knowledge with you. And the black line is where you go knight to f6 in this position. You play d6 first because you don't want to run into e5. I've done a free lesson on this on my YouTube channel. If you search for that black line, you can find it if you want to learn more about the opening. And now my opponent played a rather rare move, bishop d3. Now, this is a side line. The, the main line is knight to c3. But bishop to d3 has been tried by a number of players because white wants to keep the, c, the c3 square for the pawn. On the downside of this move, the bishop's quite passive here. It, it, you know, it's stuck behind its own pawns. So I continued in typical black line fashion with e5. My opponent now played c3 and now knight bd7. This is like stage one of the black line. And now my opponent has two choices, f4 or knight f3. Now the move f4 scares me a little bit more, but you can actually here rely on your pawn on e5. During, during the course, when I was preparing the course of working, I called this little pawn the Spartan pawn. Why? Maybe you can guess. Look, he's facing off against three pawns. Green's a bloody confusing color. I didn't even know we had green here. Blue, should we go for a bit of blue? And this Spartan pawn, when they say a Spartan warrior was worth three of any other warriors, and there's a bloody fly in here, that's what happens when you open a, a window. But this one little guy here is holding up those three pawns, so you often rely on this when you're playing the back line. But anyway, my opponent played knight to f3, uh, and now I had to decide what to do. Now, I was figuring here, and in my chessboard course, um, which might change actually, a great thing with chessboard, you can change it as you go on. I just recommend to set up with c6 and bishop e7, which is absolutely fine. Now, as you'll know, the black line is where you aim to play g5, where you go h6 and g5. But I suddenly, it suddenly occurred to me in this position that maybe this plan is not as good when his knight is not on c3. And this is the kind of like, I suppose, reasonably deep thinking you, 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 I, you, know, you have to get into the mood of doing when you understand openings. And I thought, if I go for this plan, so let's just say I go bishop e7, castles, now you normally go c6. I thought he'd develop his knight, queen c7, rook e1. And if I go h6 and g5, which is what you do in the black line, I suddenly realized that his knight has a very good root. And I thought he could go knight here, and if I go g5, consistent, then he goes knight g3. And I don't want to allow knight into that square. This is something which is much harder to do when he has a knight on c3, because if he goes to e2, e4 is weak in those lines. So it's, it's just little subtleties 
that you have to consider. But on the downside of my opponent's opening, he hasn't got pressure against f7, so I don't need to rush with bishop e7. And instead, the move g6 made a lot more sense to me because my bishop is a little bit more active on, on g7, and it's a bit like a king's Indian defense, another opening I play. So this is a very logical way to play. My opponent castled, bishop g7, rook e1, I castled, this idea of g5, not so strong. He played h3, I'm not sure he needs to do that. And now I've got to figure out my only undeveloped piece is the bishop here. When you start the opening and you develop all your pieces. And b6 looked like a perfectly sensible way to play because the bishop here can attack his center. He played bishop e2, bishop b7, a4. Don't really want to allow this pawn to come up and annoy me. So I just stop it in his tracks a5. And I was very happy with the way this opening had gone. I've got equality, the opening, the black line has worked. So the defeat certainly wasn't on the opening, but that my opponent was a stronger player than me. And in this position, my opponent now played knight a3, and he's trying to put the knight on this square with a bit of pressure. And this is my first decision here. Not pressure on that square, but pressure on this square. And I played pawn takes d4 and rook e8 with an interesting idea in mind. Generally, giving away the center is not such a good idea. And this pawn, the Spartan pawn, is very nice. And it would have made sense to keep it here. But I need to do something here. Uh, I need to come up with a plan. And my other plan, which maybe would have suited my style more, and even if it's not the best move, you've got to play moves that suit style, was maybe rook e8 straight away. Um, and the point of this is now I'm threatening to take a pawn and win here, because I have one, two three pieces attacking that pawn. And I assume this would force my opponent to play d5. And he's now closed down the position. I quite like closed positions which I can attack from. My opponent will go knight c4 and b4, getting to play on the queen side. But this kind of position is, is what you get in the king's Indian defense. And this is where having knowledge of other openings can improve your own openings, because you can pick bits from various other bits and make a lovely cocktail of ideas and here I could do something along the lines even if it's slow move my rook back to this square and now playing something like knight to h5 and at some point maybe h6 first to stop knight g5 but at some point I can play something along the lines and it's going to be a very double-edged game here maybe I you know I have to lose a bit of time but this bishop could be all right here and at some point I'm going to play f5 and this is the move you play in the king's in defense and I, I really like this kind of position in general because I'm attacking on the king's side and my opponent on the queen's side and checkmate ends the game. So so this was one way I could have played. But the move I played in the game was also interesting. Let's have a look. Because I go rook e8 and now if he plays the pawn on here, it's totally different. My bishop is fantastic and I have a very nice square for my knight. So this would now be bad for him. So he has to play knight d2, which is the kind of move he wouldn't really want to play a backwards move with his knight. So I think I've, I'm already doing very well here. And now I often get carried away which imag with imaginative, crazy ideas. And I had a long think here. And I kind of knew what the best move was, but I also was just looking at his king and thinking, oh, I was like, come, come I'm going to throw everything at that boy. Oh, God, I, I'm just going to attack it like a madman. And it was very interesting how I played it, but in hindsight, if we think logically, we can see that these pieces are doing a good job, so I don't really need to do anything with these guys. But my knight on d7 is not great, and I should probably just play knight to f8. Uh, and this is bringing the knight towards a very decent square, which will threaten to attack and come in. And I'm very happy with this position. Another interesting idea, thinking about your worst piece, is actually knight b8. Because there's a big hole here, and if I can travel in there, it's a very nice square for the knight. So I think both of these ways would have given me a great game. Black Lion has been a, a total success against a very strong player. It's nice to see that one of the best players in the world, he, he hasn't found a way to get an advantage against his opening. I say one of the best players in the world, okay, he's not top 10, but he, he's bloody good. So anyway, after knight d2, I now came up with knight h5, and this is kind of typical me. I'm just going to aim my pieces at his king and try to checkmate him. 
So my opponent played knight b5, a good move, he needs to defend this square, and now I had another long think, and I went with my original plan. The move I really wanted to play here was f5, trying to open up pieces to checkmate him. And I came to the conclusion, and I haven't checked this with the computer, that pawn takes f5, and now queen h4 is my idea. I'm just throwing all my pieces at his king, because he has a little bit of traffic jam here. And I'm trying to take advantage that his pieces are, are a little bit discombobulated. And that I have better development and I have nice pieces. But I didn't like the line, uh, rook takes e8 and now knight to f3. And I thought after something like this, and I look at this variation here, I couldn't see a good follow-up for myself in this position. And I, I analyzed that this can get into trouble just with this check on d5. And I don't quite have enough here, I felt, at the time. So I went back to the second plan. The second plan was knight on d to f6. And again, this is following with my principle, throwing everything at his king. And I'm also trying to tie down his pieces. So I'm trying to improve my pieces and, and you know, tie down his pieces because his knight now would like to move to get the bishop out, but then I win the pawn here. So he goes knight c3. This is a nice maneuver that my opponents played bringing the knight back to a good central square. And now knight to f4. And this is, again, quite a dangerous position for him. He goes knight to f3. And obviously I'd seen this idea when I had um, played my move, what was it, knight to h5. This is this is all, all in my analysis. And now I go bring the other knight here. So I've got this lovely knight on f4. And what I was really relying on this position was the move f5 to give me some kind of attack against his king. And he got very excited. He plays king h2. Whenever your opponent plays move, what's the threat? The threat is g3 and pushing my knight away. If I start moving backwards in this position, it's going to go wrong. Even g4 in some particular position. So I have to keep playing actively. And now f5. And this is where I got to in my analysis uh, when I came up with this concoction of an idea. And I thought this was very interesting. And he had a long think now, because I think I've got a good position. Um, I think the openings, I've played all right. My idea is if he takes here, I'm now going to take on e1. And if he takes to the queen, I can destroy his king side and my queen can fly in. And this has got to be probably losing for my opponent. I have too many pieces around his king. So the other option is to take the knight, but now he loses control of h4. So I flick the queen in, threatening queen takes f2, threatening such ideas as bishop takes g2, queen takes h3. And this is a very dangerous attacking position as well. Um, I've got four pieces attacking his king. So he has to be a little bit careful. So after a long think, my opponent now played g3, which is the safest move, trying to kick my pieces back. I captured on e4, and now around here, maybe I played a mistake. I should play d5. At the time, I thought that like, the exchange of light square bishops helped me because his king might be a bit weak, but this never materialized. And he's found a nice safe way to deal with my threats, which you expect from a top player as, as, as he is. And originally, when I went into this variation, I wanted to put my knight on this square because it's an outpost, but... I realized after queen b3, c6, knight c3, I can't keep my knight there and I'm in trouble. So I had to play knight e6. My opponent now played a very good move, rook a3, trying to double up. And now d5, knight g5, and we got this position here. Now I have to admit, I was pretty confident around here, but my next move was very, very stupid. I was quite confident. I'm always over optimistic. It's maybe one of my downfalls, you know, uh, being a bit optimistic in chess positions. It's a strength and a weakness, as often, uh, you know, the, these things can be. And I thought, you know, in the long run, I'm doing quite well because my pawn structure is nice and this pawn is weak. I can maybe push my pawns forwards, but he has got this activity. And I should probably hear try to do some simplifying with like rook takes rook and queen d7. Now I played queen d7 here and I was aware of his next move and this is one of those slack moves where you kind of 
And this is one of the biggest mistakes I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well in, in players in general. You release your guard a little bit. You kind of got out the opening, you think your position is good, and you play a little bit lazily. You can't play any lazy moves, even in completely winning positions. And it's one of the biggest mistakes lower rated players do. Playing a lazy move, letting the advantage slip, and converting good positions. And the best way to convert good positions, I find, is a lot psychological. You, you really have to make sure you don't relax until you've won the bloody game. And then you can go and have a pint. And in this position, after 95, I suddenly thought, yeah, I, I don't like this position. I, I totally forgot that my intended plan, Queen F5, which I thought attacked three things, so he couldn't play knight e5, is just met by f4. And then he's got this beautiful knight. So I had to take on e5, and this position I thought was worse for me, but the computer really thinks it's incredibly bad for me. But I now try to do something by using my pawns. And the problem is, his bishop is very dangerous, and he has this attack now on my king. I hate being attacked. But it's still a very exciting position. Let's go on. So he starts pushing on the king side. And I, tr I mean, this is a real trump, this pawn. I I've got a nice protected pass pawn, so it's not completely hopeless for me. And now rook a7 is a good move because I'm going to need to defend along here. The only way he's going to win is by playing f5 at some point. But as long as I've got this covered, which I do by one, two, three, four pieces, it's very hard for him to play this. Saying that, he can now, instead of playing bishop h6, we're both getting shorter time, played e6 here. And this would have really won the game, I think. Knight takes e6, queen b3, and oh, I can't defend here. So he missed an opportunity. But my position is still worse, and we sort of play around a bit. I managed to hold the balance. Um, he's not making any progress. I stop his bishop coming in here. I'm just waiting, covering all of his advances as much as I can. There is an opportunity if I get my knight to d5, I can start being better because I'm threatening the pawn and my knight on d5 stops an attack. So, you know, it's not all passive. We dance around a little bit more. I have to, in this case, offer a draw repetition, especially in a time situation. And now he plays here and he gets a little bit impatient. This is move 37, the time trial move 40. And I now get the opportunity to take here and all of a sudden I can start a counterattack. Because my knight can even travel out here. I can play h6 and rook takes f4. So, for example, if he takes, I go h6, and all of a sudden he could be quite a lot worse. Bishop h4, rook takes f4, and I'm probably winning. So, you've got to take your opportunities when you can. He played queen e2, and now I took on g4, and he played rook takes g4. And it's around here, I move 39, where I missed my chance, because here I'm a pawn up. It's the kind of position I could easily be better in. Um, you know, he's still, got a, he's still got these two pawns. I overestimated my chances again, but it's not terrible. Oh, why has it gone autofocus? I've got to change that. Okay, I hate it when the when the video does that. Uh, it's it, I'll tell you what, Logitech, Logitech is a horrible piece of software. It's what every streamer uses, uh, Logitech, and it's terrible. It's a terrible piece of software uh, that every time you can see now actually what it really looks like. I'm not actually, there you go, I'm not actually in space, unfortunately, as much as I'd love to be. Um, but yeah, it's a horrible piece of software. I wish they'd bloody sort it out. Every time you turn your computer on with Logitech, you have to adjust the camera settings. It doesn't save automatically. And I've spoken to a lot of editors and stuff about this, and it's just crazy. Anyway, stop moaning, Simon. There we go, there we go. So anyway, uh, let's hope I don't move too much and it does that again. So here, I miss a chance. I could now go knight d6. And if my knight gets to f5, I think, if anything, I prefer black's position. If he ever plays this move, he can't do it here because obviously rook takes f6. But I can always sack the exchange like this. And I have a phenomenal position. And it may be his king, which is weak. So I miss my chance now. And after rook takes g4, I came up with the idea of putting a rook on g6, which looked very solid with seconds on my clock. And I'm also equal... I think at least equal in these positions after rook g6 but now I make a mistake and 
I was getting a bit too optimistic here. Uh, and my next move is actually a big mistake. I totally missed an idea of my opponents. I assumed all endings would be better for me, but they're not. And my first instinct was to play knight g7 here, which I should have done. Again, if my knight gets here, I'm probably doing extremely well. So he has to really go bishop f6. But now, as I mentioned, I can sacrifice the exchange because I have two pawns for the exchange. But I have a wonderful knight on f5, which defends, attacks. His king is now going to be exposed. I'm threatening to take that one. And I think around here, I certainly prefer my position. I, I would really prefer my chances, actually, to get at least a draw uh, and possibly even win against a good opponent. So this was this was um, bad on my part. I played queen f5. Uh, it looked like a safe option. And I totally underestimated that after queen takes f5 here, he, his next move. Can you see his next move? Can you improve on me? and play like uh, one of the best players in the world. What did he now play? Which was like, oh, it was, I still thought I was all right, but he played exceptionally well after this. And I think really that's my only sort of bad move in the game. I think I played all right, except for this queen f5 move. And it just shows you at this level of play how one slight, slight mistake you'll lose against a top player. It's not even a blunder. And now he plays bishop d8. And the issue is he starts targeting my pawns. And these two guys are very strong. It's irrelevant I've got an extra H pawn. These two pawns, his past pawns, can become incredibly strong. My one past pawn, not so much. And I now exchanged on this square. And my next move, I was hoping for bishop takes b6, because if he plays this move, knight e6, and actually here again, I, I prefer black, because I've, I've blockaded his two pawns. My knight and rook are going to be very active. I'm going to win that pawn. And my d pawn is only three squares from queening. So in this position, this is what I was hoping for when I have chances to win. But my opponent played absolutely brilliantly here, I have to say, and played some moves I didn't consider. Bishop f6. Why? Well, I mean, I saw this, of course. I have to stop rook g4, so I have to go h5. Now king f2, king h7. And now another brilliant move. What would you guys play? And after the next move, I'm actually just technically losing. A pity, because not such a bad game. Now, bishop takes g7. It's funny. A lot of you, I expect, don't want to get rid of this bishop. But my knight is very good. It can come here. And that will tie his rook down to the defense of this. And again, I've definitely got chances to be better there. I am pawn up after all. And if I can stop his pawns from moving, I'm going to be better. I can win this position. But after he takes off my knight, even though in this position, after king f3, I'm a pawn up. When his king comes here, his two passed pawns mean they're much more dangerous than anything I've got. And I think I'm already lost here. Example, king g6, king e4. I must move my rook. His idea is now to activate his rook. And now he does just that. He plays the rest of the game very well. I go rook h8. My one hope was to throw up Harry. Come on, Harry. Save the game for me, boy. And after this move, he simply plays f5. I have to keep my king as near to the pawns as I can. Try to blockade him. He plays e6. And now he goes rook g1. And he's starting to come in, you see. He wants to get his king and rook here, and he's going to slowly push me. And it's very close to being okay for me, but close is not good enough in this game. I played rook h6, and again, I was overconfident here. It's unbelievable. Apart from his next move, I'm actually doing very well here, probably winning. So again, try to guess the moves I'm going through these videos. Can you play like a 2650 rated player? I think he's actually nearly 2700 now. Well, you know, because my idea is very simple. I'm going to push this pawn, and if he has to defend against that... I will pick off these pawns and I'll be winning. But he now plays rook g8. And I totally underestimate this move. And look at the way he finishes the game. It's brilliant. Did you find rook g8? I pushed Harry. Come on, boy. Check. But now he pushes my king all the way back. If I go forwards, he simply plays e7, threatening to queen. He simply plays f6 and rook f8 next and he's winning. 
And after king e8, he now plays king e5 so that he can push his pawns. Come on, Harry. Rook b7. Harry! Oh, look how close he is. And now rook b8. And look at this brilliant way he plays. f6 check. Have to take it. And now rook b7 check. And the issue is when he takes my rook, he's actually going to be mating me here. So I can never queen. The only square I can go to so that he can't take my rook is d8. Because if he takes my rook now, I actually do queen Harry and I'm winning, for example. This position I'm winning. Am I? No, because he still goes here. Ah, I can go here though. This is the point. And when he queens, I go here. I'm certainly not losing. I'm two pawns up. This is winning for me, maybe. Unless he can get a perpetual check. Might be winning for me. Because my queen can come back to b7 to avoid checks. So he plays fantastically. Can you see his win? And again, pause if you need to. E7 check. And now if I go to this square, now he takes here. And when I queen, he checks me. He checks me again and he's winning. So after E7, my best chance is King C8. But now he plays the very calm Rook A7. He's gonna, he can Rook it. So let's say I Queen it. He can Rook it. Checkmate if he wants to embarrass me. <laughs> and after King B8, he now plays again a very accurate move. Rook D7. My Rook cannot do anything to stop his pawn. Next move, he's going to Queen and win the game. So an interesting game, nevertheless. Um, quite close. Um, I mean, I think it was quite a good game. It's not not too bad on my part. I was a bit disappointed to lose afterwards. I'm a very good loser. Uh, who is? All the best players aren't. Uh, you know, if you if you're happy to lose, then you're probably never going to get better. So it's good to cry when you lose. I didn't cry, but you get the idea. Um, and the opening worked very well, the black line. So I'm learning more about this. Like any opening, the more you practice it, the better you get. And one bit of advice I would give you, you know, if you get a chance to play in over the board tournaments and get away from the internet, it's the best way to improve. But always analyze your losses. Try to work out where you went wrong in the game, psychologically what you were thinking when you went wrong, so you can improve that in future, what your weaknesses are, so you can work on them, and what your strengths are in this game. I was a bit over optimistic in my chances. I rushed, relaxed at critical stage, and I maybe played a little bit too creative on the king side when I could have played something a lot more solid. So I've learned those things and I've learned a bit more about the opening. Um, now, I will end the video very shortly, but I'll tell you it was a bit of a bloody nightmare weekend. Absolutely terrible that. On the, I mean, it was only Saturday and Sunday. I finished my Sunday game quite quick because I wanted to get home, and it's a two and a half hour drive. And I went to my car, I started it up, and it was like, what is that sound? And some scumbags had gone to the car park at the McCure Hotel in Downtree. They'd gone under the car, and they did six cars with a hacksaw, and they hacksawed off um, six my exhaust pipes. And also my something else, I'm not a car person, carbonator. No, that's something you put in drinks. Something else, which they sell as scrap, totally screwed up my car. So my car could not drive. David Howe had to scrap his car. So did someone else I know. And I had to wait 24 hours to get it towed back. The tow company from my crappy insurance, don't go with privileged insurance, bunch of thieving bastards. And they are with Green Line. Do not go privilege or Green Line insurance. I'm changing. They got a tow person to eventually pick me up. And he dropped me off at a service station on, on the wrong way on the M25. And I'm like, what's going on here with my car? And he goes, oh, there's someone ready to do the next part of the leg. I'm like, why can't you take me back? And says, oh, no, I can't do that. You know, I'm not, that's not in the contract. So he dumped me at the service station. And he said, yeah, the guy's already here. He's just in, in the thing. I've got to go now. So I was like, okay, not the end of the world. Three hours later, I'm still sitting there. My phone has died. It's not working properly. So I, don't, I can't ring anyone. And I'm like, hmm. I had to call out a private person to tow me back. 300 quid that cost. And it's going to cost over a grand to fix my bloody exhaust. So if you want to support me and help me out, buy the Black Lion course. But... The only plus side was it, 
I mean, out of the whole story was I'm, I'm not drinking much in my have a little break, but I had to cave in. And after the first hour of sitting in my car, just doing twiddly dick, I basically thought, I could get a bloody beer. So I got some beer from the service station and I sat in my car. Remember, I'm not driving because it's getting towed. I'm just drunk beer like this, waiting, just looking at the lorries coming in and out. Great way to spend a Monday. Oh, there's a lorry. Yeah, so there you go. Anyway, my rant over. <laughs> um, I don't do many analysis videos. They're not actually that popular of a lot of you. I do do them longer than other channels because it's not just about me getting viewers for this channel. I, obviously, I'd like to get to more viewers, but I want to try to help you guys actually improve. And these videos are maybe more for the serious players out there. And if you're serious about improving, you know, they're never going to bring you lots of views, but I think they're a good lesson. You're getting a lesson off a grandmaster in the way they're thinking. So they're probably, if anything, worth much more, maybe not as entertaining, but worth more than Blitz videos or anything else. But let me know your, your feedback. They are quite rare, but you know it's nice to play such a strong player and, and the black line. What can I say? So I'm now gonna get ready for Title Tuesday. Um, so that'll be fun, maybe. And I'll try and put the video up of that. Cheers.